Howdy, and welcome to the series introduction of Farmers Fight, a podcast focused on the historical American populist movement and its fellow travelers. In this series, we will learn why poor white and black farmers, labor unionists, women suffragists, and a host of other political outsiders organized the largest grassroots democratic movement in American history and laid the groundwork for much of modern American society. Using populism as an umbrella term, we will be talking about who and what by detailing the period between Reconstruction to the 1920s. We will discuss some major and minor players, their actions, and hopefully tease out notions that motivated a plethora of groups I'm collectively calling populist. Now, this show is not a partisan take on populism or even a discussion of our current wave of populism in the West. It is, however, a historical analysis of the origins and character of American populism in the late 19th century. For now, it's also a hobby of mine, but one that I do want to approach with a bit of scholarliness. So I'm going to take my time with regard to putting out new episodes because I want to get this history right and I want to present it in a full and robust way. But you can stay up to date on my progress by subscribing to the podcast on any of your preferred apps. I don't really do the social media thing, but I did sign up for an Instagram. You can find me there at Farmers Fight Podcast. That's all one word. I'm going to post uh, text from sources, historical images, and pretty much anything I deem worthy. You can get updates about the show by clicking on the RSS feed link on my website. It's farmersfightpodcast.com. I know, very original. You can also find the series bibliography there and email me any questions or criticisms. Host at farmersfightpodcast.com is the email. Lastly, I wouldn't be a very good 20th century pamphleteer slash digital panhandler without pointing out the fact that you can make a donation to the show on my website. I think I have it set up where you can sign up for reoccurring donations or make a one-time donation based on whatever you think it's worth. I'm operating on the value for value idea here, so if you think you got some value from the show, donate what you think it's worth. With any luck, your support could help me put out more content in a timely manner or perhaps fund some trip to a dusty archive in the middle of the country where I can do some original research. So that's it. That's my spiel. Let's get this thing started. Thanks for listening to Farmer's Fight. In 1931, at a meeting of the Minnesota Historical Society, history professor John D. Hicks presented a paper titled The Persistence of Populism. In the opening stanza, Hicks cites a Western farmer in 1890 who sets forth the doctrine that the cranks always win. The quote begins by stating, The cranks are those who do not accept the existing order of things and propose to change them. I'm sure everyone has heard the misappropriated Gandhi quote, which actually comes from an American labor organizer in 1918. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, and then you win, or something like that. While this little nugget of wisdom feels quaintly homespun, the assertion that the cranks always win has basis in historical reality with regards to the historical American populace. Beginning in the 1870s, the American agrarian classes revolted against poor economic conditions and a tumultuous social climate. Soon, American farmers and urban laborers wrestled with the first age of globalization, increased technological advancement best embodied by the railroads, and a rise in what Professor Lawrence Goodwin termed the corporate state. By the 1890s, the populist movement had taken root throughout the depressed South, the Southwest, as well as the middle border region, which is an old-fashioned way of saying the Midwest, the Rockies, and the Northwest. Most who joined branches of the Texas Farmers Alliance and other affiliated groups were often rural, poor, struggling, or outright destitute. The movement attracted various single-issue radicals and found allies in the budding industrial labor and suffragist movements. More than anything, populist ideology spoke in the language of Jefferson and Jackson and the traditional American belief in the independent yeomanry. It sought to uphold these values by curbing the exploitative and tyrannical nature of the emerging industrial state by advocating and at times even agitating for a cooperative commonwealth. While the populace may not have achieved their goal to bring about an America that they saw as being closer to the nation's founding principles, they did succeed in shifting the Overton window 
i.e. the range of ideas tolerated in public discourse, as many of the issues that they championed found expression in law by 1929. They also had an influence on later political projects such as the Socialist Party and have been seen as the forebearers of the Progressive Era. From the Warehouse Act of 1916, farm loan banks, women's suffrage, the Clayton Antitrust Act, and yes, even the Aldrich Virland Act of 1908 that reestablished the Hamiltonian central banking system. Despite their contributions to American social and political history, we don't seem to learn much about their movement in the public school system. At least I didn't growing up in Texas. At best, I heard a narrative that acknowledged the economic strife of the Gilded Age while tacitly lionizing people like Jay Gould, John D. Rockefeller, and other robber barons of the day. But this movement of the common people, as defined in the late 19th century, was largely a reaction and even outright rejection of the government-subsidized corporate monopolies, robber barons, and moneyed interests who controlled the nation's economy largely for their own benefit. The agrarian uprising and subsequent populist revolt was, as historian Lawrence Goodwin put it, attributed to the same thing that was causing discord across the Western world, the Industrial Revolution. It was also born out of the aftermath of the American Civil War and drew upon the ideological embers of the Age of Revolution. Contemporary historians have dubbed the populist movement left-wing in orientation as it tended to seek general cooperative organization. Between the 1880s and 1890s, various expressions of the movement advocated for federally aided industry, land reform, restrictions on corporate monopolies, a reduction in the work week, monetary reform, elimination of private banks, establishment of public saving systems, and direct election of senators. Some branches even participated in cross-racial coalitions and advocated for women's suffrage, which is, suffice to say, not the norm for the era. Though the populace may be left of center according to political scientists, the people themselves identified as conservative, which makes total sense to me since they were literally seeking to conserve the lifeways of their ancestors in the face of a new economic and social paradigm. But they were not socially regressive. They did not attempt to halt the march of industrial change. Rather, they sought to redirect the forces roiling American society towards the common good, towards a Jeffersonian and Jacksonian influenced ideal of the cooperative commonwealth, an Arcadian humanism. In this series, we are defining the populist movement as existing between 1877 until 1896. However, like the Star Wars franchise, I feel it necessary to explain how Anakin became Darth Vader before he killed the Emperor in Return of the Jedi. Okay, probably a bad comparison, but my point is you can't understand the agrarian and populist revolts without understanding Reconstruction first. Moreover, I'm going to pull a Disney and try to cash in on the rest of the story, which is just a fancy way of saying I'm going to follow the populace after the end of their movement and into other political projects, such as Southern Socialism. Next episode, I will officially begin the series by introducing populism as a general idea. Much has been written about populism since the demise of the original American movement, but it's worth explaining how contemporary scholarship views modern and historical populism differently. After that, I'll begin looking at Reconstruction and pulling out the parts that matter the most to our topic. We will look at the historical context that brought about the populace, as well as the origins and issues that motivated them to organize. So expect some discussion of economics and political philosophy. By the end of Reconstruction, we will come to the founding of a succession of reformist movements, mainly in the Midwest and South. We will detail organizations such as the Patrons of Husbandry, which you probably know as the Grange, the Greenback Party, Texas Farmers Alliance, Louisiana Farmers Union, and the Agricultural Wheel, just to name a few. Following the collapse of populism, I will also follow the old pops, as they were called, into new political projects such as socialism and individualist anarchism. I'm thinking this will probably be the end of the series, but I'm leaving it open just because I'm reading new information and might want to go in a different direction. But for now, that's the general chronology. Reconstruction to 1920. Next episode, I will kick off this series by talking about populism in general. It might get a little tedious, but it is important to get a sense of what I mean by populism in the modern context so we can juxtapose that against the historical populace. All right, that's it. Woo, I think I did this under 10 minutes. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> thanks for listening and stay tuned for more Farmer's Fight.